Welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly podcast on leadership with Scott Miller. That's me. I'm your host each week where I'm privileged to interview some of the greatest minds in industry and business, philanthropy, researchers, best-selling authors, five-star, four-star generals, Pulitzer Prize winning people, and curate a conversation for each of you, our listeners and viewers, each week to really invest in your own leadership skills, whether you are a C-suite leader in a multi-global organization, whether you're a solopreneur or an entrepreneur, whether you are perhaps a mid-level on the rise leader. Maybe you're a leader in your family or a leader in your life. We try to bring people from all walks of life, some with fame, some with not, to increase your awareness, your self-awareness, how you can become a better leader. I'm also privileged to be the author of numerous books, including the Master Mentor Series from HarperCollins, where each year I write a volume about the guest on this podcast with their permission. Volume one and volume two are out each year. I select 30 guests that I think shared a transformative insight on the podcast, and I write a short, easy, breezy chapter about them. The books are available in softcover print, audio, digital, and video from Lit Video Books. Check out mastermentors.com. Who knows, maybe today's guest might be willing to be featured in volume four. In fact, our guest is one of those in the upper echelons of the leadership conversation. I've spent 30 years of my career dedicated to leadership development, four at the Walt Disney Company and now 27 here at the Franklin Covey Company. And what comes to mind to me are about maybe eight to 10 people that have truly shaped this conversation whether it's Tony Robbins or Ken Blanchard, or Stephen Covey or Sir Ken Robinson, Marcus Buckingham, Liz Wiseman, Kim Scott, Seth Godin, Dan Pink, and others, what these people have in common is a selfless abundance mentality to take their research, their practice, and bring it to you to make you a better leader. And to add to that group of people is Simon Sinek. And he is here today to talk about all things leadership. Simon, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks very much. Good to, uh, good to see you, Scott. Glad to have you, man. Thank you for joining us. Uh, excited to talk about a lot of your research, a lot of your books. Obviously, Franklin Covey is, if not one of the most trusted leadership brand in the world. We've worked very hard to work with our clients around the world to curate that brand. And we love to shine this podcast spotlight on other people and their interest as well. We don't think we know everything. We love to bring our clients and our listeners and viewers insights from people like yourself that have enormous influence. In fact, I believe your TED Talk is maybe the third highest viewed TED Talk in history and is the number one viewed TED Talk on the topic of leadership. No insult if I got those numbers wrong. Your books have sold millions of copies. You have brought to the leadership conversation a palpable voice around optimism, collaboration, teamwork, synergy. You kind of coined the conversation around explaining why, your latest book, The Infinite Game, is a masterpiece. We'll kind of water ski today across a lot of these insights around leadership. Simon, first, would you rewind a couple of decades? And for those people who may have thought you came out of the womb as a best-selling author and an influencer in leadership, they can better understand what your journey was to have earned this platform. Uh, my, I think one of the reasons that my work resonates with people is it was never a commercial or an academic exercise. It was born out of uh, personal experience and quite frankly, personal struggle. Um, my, I, had a, uh, uh, I was living the American dream. Um, I owned my own little marketing consultancy. Um, and after a few years of doing that, I completely fell out of love with my own work. And I was deeply embarrassed by that because superficially everything looked fine. And so all of my energy went into pretending that I was happier, more successful, and more in control than I than I felt, um, and that's uh, let me tell you, that's a dark place. That's tiring. Um, all that lying, hiding, and faking every day, um, and uh, I became paranoid. And it was a really, it was it was a dark time. And it wasn't until a very very dear friend of mine came to me and said, "Something's wrong. Something's different." Uh, did I take that as an opportunity to come clean? And it lifted a huge weight off my shoulders. And now all of that energy that I was putting into lying, hiding, and faking, I redirected that energy into finding a solution, trying to figure out where, what happened to my passion, um, what happened to my love for my work. You know, people give stupid advice. Find your bliss, follow your flow, you know, do what you love. Thank you. Like, totally useless. Um, I was doing what I love. I was, I was doing the same thing, and I didn't love it anymore. And so 
uh, I made this discovery that based on the biology of human dis uh, decision making, every one of us knows what we do. Some of us know how we do it, but very few of us can articulate why we do what we do. And that's what I realized that I had I had lost. And um, once I rediscovered my why and was able to put it into words, my passion has never waned since. Simon, when I think about leadership, of which, like you, I've dedicated the majority of my career to, I know nothing about restaurants, movies, TV programs. Don't take my recommendation on movies. But I know a few things about the Noted. leadership industry. Um, by the way, Booty Call is the best movie in history, followed only by Austin Powers 1 and 2 and 3 in that order. Hence my <laughs> point, don't take my advice on movie recommendations. But I know a lot about leadership, and I think you are one of the voices that has infused empathy into the conversation around what makes great leaders, amongst the yeah. many things you've championed. And I, and I may have this point wrong, but take it in the spirit in which I'm offering it. To what extent did the traumatic experience you had with your sister over two decades ago and the, the traumatic loss of her fiance, did that infuse you with um, a passion around caretaking and empathy and love? Maybe you would share that story as appropriate as you have in other settings. But it struck me as, I wonder if that was a pivot point, one of many pivot points where you reoriented or oriented more tightly your focus on relationships and connection. Yeah, so my sister was engaged to be married and uh, two weeks before her wedding, she and her fiance uh, were taking the New York City subway to go downtown to get their marriage license. Um, he did not feel well. And as they pulled into the station, they were supposed to get out of. Um, he stepped between the cars to get some fresh air. We don't really know what happened, whether he had a heart attack or whether he fainted, we don't know. But he fell and he hit the third rail, he touched the third rail and was electrocuted and killed um, right in front of her. Um, it was a horrible day. Um, and my sister is the most remarkable human being you will ever meet, um, who, who muscled through that and is, has a, is happily married with two kids now and lives a happy life. Um, and no matter how, whatever I go through, um, um, I know that I can get through pretty much anything because I saw this remarkable woman do just that. Um, uh, um, you know, we talk about post-traumatic stress. We very rarely talk about post-traumatic growth. Um, and both can occur even simultaneously. Um, and I think she grew from that experience, um, and I think our family grew from that experience. Um, you know, I, I'm, I am an eternal optimist, and, and even in tragedy, I, I have a it's sickness that I still see the silver lining. And I think any family that's gone through any kind of trauma or tragedy can relate that it, it, it does bring the family closer together. Um, you, you are your best support system. I, I, I don't know if that experience sort of was a pivot for me professionally um, in, in terms of recognizing empathy, but, uh, um, but it, it, it reinforced and doubled down on just the relationship I have with my sister and the importance of, of family and loved ones um, to get us through pretty much anything. Um, and you know, most of the things that we'll go through in a personal or professional life will pale in comparison to that kind of trauma. Uh, and if we can get through that, we can get through anything. Simon, thanks for your eloquence and your vulnerability. Uh, thanks for sharing this story for those who probably don't know that story. And I think one great lesson that you've given to all of our listeners and viewers, perhaps through your sister's tragedy and that of her fiance losing his life, is that there is growth and pain. There's growth and mm -hmm. trauma. And if you can find the, the wherewithal, the peace to look for that growth in any trauma, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's aspirational but it's also practical. Because as you were thinking about it, I was thinking about, I haven't experienced a lot of trauma in my life, but I have experienced setbacks and things like that. And if you can find growth in it, it helps to blunt the pain, does it not? Well, I think there's an, an analogy that we, you know, professional analogies, um, uh, which is we've too often in, in professional uh, environments talk about what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? We do it in interviews. You know, what are your strengths? What's your biggest weakness? Well, I'm a perfectionist, you know. Um, uh, and I actually don't believe in strengths and weaknesses. I actually think that's nonsense. Um, I think all of those things are relative. They're contextual. You know, we all have characteristics and attributes. And in some contexts, those characteristics and attributes 
are strengths and in some those are weaknesses. For example, um, somebody who's uh, highly organized and process oriented, you know, in some situations that is a huge asset. And in other situations, it might be a weakness because sometimes we need quick decision making, for example. Um, so I think what's important is for us to recognize what our assets, uh, what our attributes and characteristics are, and then know the settings where those are strengths and weaknesses. And that goes for uh, positive and negative experiences as well, or positive and negative feelings. You know, humans are not binary. We're complex, messy organisms. And, you know, we can even have simultaneous, we can have uh, simultaneous feelings. We can have different feelings at the same time, different feelings simultaneously. Um, and they can even be opposite. You know, you can be suffering sadness and, and depression while you're going through lockdown. Um, at the same time, you can be excited by the entrepreneurial opportunity presented to you during lockdown. Um, we, and, and this makes us, this makes us sort of fascinating human beings. But I think we, we too often, especially professionally, parse things out to be either black or white or binary or even, even opposite. It's not true, it's all the same at the same time. And so in all, in all tragedy, in all setbacks, there are lessons and opportunity for growth, all. And in all opportunity and all successes, there is cost. There is a cost for every success that any of us have achieved. And so neither of them are clean. Neither of them are completely bad or completely good. They both have opportunity and liability attached. Simon, let's pivot to the topic of leadership, something we're both uh, very passionate about. I mean, we've come so far in our understanding of what constitutes great leadership, right? Um, empathy, compassion, trust, credibility, character. Yeah. The data is there, the research is there, the training is there, the books are there, Franklin Covey mm -hmm. is there. Why, to the extent you agree with this, why are there still so many bad leaders and managers out there when there's so much obsession about it in the industry and in the marketplace? Well, I think it goes back to what we were just saying a moment ago, which is, Human beings are emotional, messy, complex animals. And so, uh, you know, nobody sits down and reads a book and sort of makes a rational decision yeah. about these things. You know, um, um, uh, people who are, who are poor leaders, there's often uh, ego and insecurity and fear and ambition and all of these messy human things that are attached. Not to mention the fact, you know, even my work, you know, I know why most organizations don't implement my work. It's because I can't predict to the day, to the time that it'll start to work. You know, great leadership and a great leadership education, um, a, a, like a human life, is a journey. It's not an event. Um, there's constant growth. There's no such thing as an expert leader. There's only students of leadership. That's all there ever are. Some are more advanced. But everybody's constantly learning. Um, uh, and I think to go on that journey, like, like I said, m I know why most organizations don't implement my, my work. It's because my work is more like exercise. It's like trying to be healthy. You know, you have to eat right, you have to uh, exercise, you have to get enough sleep, you have to nurse your personal relationships. There's lots of things you have to do simultaneously. You can't do them all well at the same time. They sort of wax and wane, that's just how it is. But I can't tell you if you start exercising exactly what day you'll be in shape or exactly what day you'll lose that weight. It's a journey. Um, and people want results to fit arbitrary timelines. Um, and so they, they don't follow things. Also, I think the other big missing thing in too many companies, quite frankly, is we don't teach people leadership. Leadership is a teachable, learnable, practicable skill. And if we don't teach it, people aren't gonna learn it. Uh, people who we think are quote unquote natural leaders, it's because they probably learned it somewhere else. Um, uh, nobody's born with it, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a huge gaping hole in, in so many companies. We teach hard skills, but we don't teach human skills. Please stop calling them soft skills. There's nothing soft about them, and hard and soft are opposites. We need to teach hard skills, and we need to teach human skills, and that's missing. We, that's a huge opportunity. I've been increasingly hearing the soft skills being referred to as the power skills, power human skills, and I think that's aptly named. Simon, I have a premise about this, and that is something we're passionate here at Franklin Covey, which is the majority of leaders that become leaders of people, they're usually plucked from the ranks of those who are individual contributors that have perfected their sales goal. You know, they're the most efficient dental hygienist or the most creative digital designer. Yeah. So of course, they're promoted to be the leader of people. And there's absolutely yeah. no correlation in being the top salesperson Correct. and being a great sales leader. In fact, I think it was HBR six, eight years ago that did a research study that said the average age someone receives their first promotion into management is age 30. Yet the average age that same person receives their first formal 
leadership development training, age 42. So you've got yeah, high producing sense. Scott Millers as a salesperson wrecking yeah. havoc across their sales team because no one's Correct. invested in them. Speak to all the leaders of the companies of the world to say, you got to get your act together and start doing what? Well, it was what I just said, which is there needs to be curriculum. Like when somebody joins the company, to your point, when young Scott Miller joined the company, the company gave you, gave you tons of training how to do your job so you'll be good at your job. And because you were good at your job, they promoted you, where you're now in a position of leading people who do the job you used to do, but we don't teach you how to do that. And that's why we get managers and not leaders, because you do know how to do your job better than them. That's what got you promoted. Yeah. And so the reason, again, we're not teaching leadership is because when I teach you the hard skills, I can look to how good you are at your job and probably count it back to some sort of revenue goal. You know, I can see a direct and more importantly, immediate correlation Whereas by teaching you leadership skills, though there will be an absolute positive benefit to uh, revenues, it may not be in the first month. Um, and again, it goes back to time and impatience and our desire to hit arbitrary numbers and arbitrary dates. Um, and it just requires a little bit of, of discipline. Like anybody who wants to get into shape or be healthy, we know the process works 100% of the time. If you work out every day for 20 minutes, 100% of, pe uh, uh, of people will get into shape if you do that. Um, I just don't know when. It's the same thing here. You, if, we, if we commit to the discipline of teaching leadership, it does work. Um, and you just, have to commit, you just have to commit to the lifestyle. I mean, it's what it is. It's a choice. Simon, I have got a complicated question that I hope you might give an elementary answer to. And that is, to the extent you're willing, if you were to hierarchically rank the necessary competence competences yeah. in great leaders, what would they be? And have they changed like post pandemic with, you know, with the focus on DE and I inclusion, with the change of virtual and hybrid work, with the change of demographics age wise, are there some competencies that you want literally millions of people to be reminded of on this podcast as a leader? Would you rank maybe the top three in order that you see? The one that's underappreciated and rarely talked about, you know, we talk about vision, charisma, like, uh, sure. I mean, I know some remarkable leaders who are not big Steve Jobs visionaries, and I know some remarkable leaders who aren't huge personalities with tons of charisma. They sort of sit quietly in the corner, and yet they're remarkable. Um, the, one, the one characteristic that is rarely talked about is courage. Um, it takes tremendous courage to lead well, um, sometimes speaking truth to power. Uh, sometimes doing the right thing, though there might be short-term costs for that. Um, leading with integrity. Integrity takes tremendous courage. Um, uh, speaking truth uh, just to your team, admitting mistakes, taking accountability, uh, leading by example. You know, I could go on and on and on. The common factor in all of these things is courage. So courage for me ranks number one always. Um, uh, integrity is, is a very close second. Um, uh, and then I think there's a humanity uh, that has to come third, um, which great leaders fundamentally are human. They're not machines. They don't pretend or claim to have all the answers or always be right. Um, um, and they understand that they are better surrounded by smart people than trying to be the smartest one in the room to prove that they're you know, worthy of the title they've been given. Um, so those, those to me would be the big three. And then everything else that we've talked about, which change with time and culture and politics and technology, um, you know, uh, someone can adapt to those things because I wouldn't want to keep changing the list just because technology, politics, uh, and, and culture are changing because those things are always changing. But I think great leadership has never changed. It's always a human enterprise, always. I think it's reasonable to say you're a bit of a futurist when it comes to the culture of work and how people organize together and work together. Is anything changed fundamentally since the pandemic, which is probably, I think, arguably the most disruptive for good and for bad impact yep. on how we work? Has something changed that's never going back that you want every leader, whether they're first level, first time, mid, senior, executive, C, suite, sure. is there something you want everyone to know to say, this ain't going to keep happening. You've got to adjust to this. Well, I'm going to answer the question two ways. One, I'm going to answer your question directly. Uh, and then uh, the other one, I'm going to sort of slightly aspirational. You know, one of the things that happened when we first went into lockdown was, and I saw this, it was all over the place. Um, uh, leaders leaned on their own humanity 
It was kind of magical. Whether they were effective or ineffective leaders prior to lockdown, um, they leaned on their humanity. They, they picked up the phone and they called their team members one by one and they said, are you okay? Well, that's just good leadership. We, we shouldn't have to have a pandemic for somebody to worry about how somebody is as a human being. I hope that remains. I hope that that concern and that empathy remains uh, for, for generations and that we don't go back to the old ways. The thing that I do think is here to stay that there is no going back is, is flexibility. I think we're in a period of tremendous flux and the dust has not settled yet and nobody has really figured out sort of are we fully going back to work? Are we not fully going back to work? Will there ever be a corporate headquarters again or not? Like, I think the jury's still out and it's still going to be a complicated uh, few years before, before that dust settles. But one thing is here to stay is flexibility. Where in the past, um, we may have had to ask permission to work at home on Friday because my kids will be home. Now we can just send an email the night before the morning of saying, hey, I'm going to be working from home today and it's all going to be a big nothing. Um, I think that's here to stay. Flexibility is here to stay. Uh, thanks, Simon. Without using my set as a cheat sheet, What's your favorite leadership book? Favorite leadership <laughs> think, uh, thought, a couple of thought leaders that have influenced the way you think about how we live, how we collaborate, how we contribute, how we create passion and mission in our lives. Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, yeah. I think is essential reading for yeah. anybody who aspires to be a leader. Um, and um, I mean, uh, and I was heavily influenced by James Kars, um, who wrote Finite and Infinite Games back in the mid eighties. Um, uh, the, it's a kooky little philosophical treatise um, that I built upon because uh, I, I, I wanted it to be, I was using it as a practice and I realized I was sort of figuring things out as I was doing that. And so I built upon the foundation that he built. So I, I think his, his thinking and Viktor Frankl's thinking have, have definitely um, helped shape and mold my, my worldview. My guess is most people listening are well aware of Man's Search for Meaning and Viktor Frankl was influential in Dr. Covey's work around the seven yeah. habits. Let's talk for a moment there and pivot. You've written a recent book called The Infinite Game. We can't mm -hmm. choose the game. We can't choose the rules. We can only choose how we play. What is the biggest difference between the finite and the infinite game? And what is that, by the way? Yeah, so... As I mentioned, Dr. Carr has defined these two types of games a bunch of years ago. Uh, finite games are defined as known players, fixed rules, and agreed upon objectives. Football, baseball. If there's a winner necessarily, there has to be a loser. But more important, there's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. Always. Um, and then you have infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players which means you don't necessarily know who all the other players are and new players can join your game whenever they want. The rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want. And the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Turns out we're players in infinite games every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. Um, there's no such thing as winning global politics. No one will ever win learning or education. No one wins career, you know? Um, and there's definitely no such thing as winning business. Um, but if we listen to the language of so many leaders, it becomes abundantly clear they don't actually know the game they're playing in. They talk about being number one or being the best or beating their competition. Based on what? No one's ever declared the winner of business. When Circuit City went bankrupt, Best Buy didn't win anything. Right? The game continues with or without the player, and new players can join whenever they want. Um, the problem is, is because we don't know the game we're playing in, we often play with the wrong mindset. Too many leaders are playing with a finite mindset in an infinite game. They're playing to win in a game that has no finish line. And the problem is, is when we do that, uh, there are some predictable and consistent outcomes. The big ones are the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, and the decline of innovation. Simon, your influence is uh, uh, certainly grounded in some of the seminal books you've written. The Infinite Game, Leaders Eat Last, Start With Why, I think you really are probably responsible, perhaps even singularly, for uh, popularizing this discussion around why. But I actually think those books pale in comparison to the influence of this little gem right here. Because uh, again, uh, my movie recommendations are, as evidenced by my previous comment, horrible. But I also have three young sons that are eight, 10, and 12, so that's why, that's why Austin Powers is so popular in our house. But this book is a masterpiece. It's called Thank you. Together is Better, A Little Book of Inspiration. And I wanna, yeah. as we end this conversation, put a spotlight on this 
Because yeah. everybody knows you for these other books you've written, but this yeah. is like a labor of love. It's, it's a small hardcover landscape yeah. book that is illustrated, and I understand the author had some contribution to the illustrator. Would you talk about your passion around Together is Better and how you want this book to be gifted and read? Mm -hmm. I love that little book. It's very special to me. Um, the inspiration for it um, uh, came from the fact that I, I, I always sort of loved children's books, that an entire story, in fact, uh, an entire moral story can be communicated with a sentence per page. And though the books that I've written are, you know, hundreds of pages long and they go into, you know, sometimes excruciating depth, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> uh, you know, about a subject, at the end of the day, so there are some basic things that everybody can learn about what good leadership looks like um, that doesn't require case studies and, you know, in-depth explanations of biology and anthropology. Um, and, and so I was inspired by, by children's books. And so I decided to write what looks like a children's book, but for adults. Um, but I know that a lot of uh, parents have used it with their kids. I'm one of the proudest ones. I'm one of the proudest stories I've heard is a, is a father whose son was subjected to bullying at school. And he, he sat down with his son and read together is better with him to help his son because there's a bully in my story. Um, but basically it tells, takes you on a beautiful uh, Joseph Campbell journey. Um, and what our hero learns is that true power comes from giving away his power. Um, um, our, our young king gives away his crown. Um, and uh, and it is a, it's a wonderful, power little book, powerful little book. It did not make it a digital, uh, um, I didn't make it digital and I didn't make it audio. It only exists in real life um, on purpose. And I designed it to be a gift. And it's designed to be a gift to be given to someone who inspires you to say thank you or to someone you want to inspire. Um, that is the reason that book exists, is to be given to be given away. Well, mission accomplished, because as I mentioned to you off here, I have gifted this book to hundreds of people around thank the world. You. I usually travel with one or two of these in the front zipper. I mean, I've, I've, I've authored seven books myself. I don't give my books out. I give Together is Better out to thank you. airline flight attendants and to baggage handlers and to hotel clerks. And I, I'm single-handedly making you a wealthy author. I'm sure that's not the thank case. You. But the book is a masterpiece. Each page offers a little gift. Leadership is an education. And the best leaders think of themselves as the students, not the teachers. Yeah. Life is beautiful not because of the things we see or the things we do. Life is beautiful because of the people we meet. I mean, you also didn't just author this True. book. You contributed to some of the illustration. And then you also offered this insanely unexpected gift inside of the book, hence why it's only in print. Talk about your contribution both to some of the illustration, which is masterful, and this other surprise bonus with purchase. So, so there's multiple things in there that are, that are special. Um, there is many handwritten pages, and there's, that's not a font. It's not even a font to look like my handwriting. I actually wrote them. Like I sat down with a, with a piece of paper on a, and, and hand wrote those pages. That's actually my handwriting. And that was important to me. I wanted it to be a very human experience. Um, there's a song at the back. Uh, Aloe Black, the, the, the uh, Grammy-nominated singer, uh, um, gave me a song. And the notes that are written um, and the, 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 the lyrics that are written are in his handwriting. I had him write the actual lyrics in his handwriting. Um, uh, uh, plus there's, um, uh, plus there's a, a, little, a little surprise, which there is a custom scent uh, early in the book. It's the smell of optimism to prepare you for your journey. You can, you, can, you, can smell the, you can smell optimism before you go on the journey of the book. And we purposefully didn't advertise it. We didn't put a sticker on the cover that says, now with scented pages, you know, we didn't put it on the Amazon uh, description. It is literally a surprise and delightful experience for anyone who gets the book. We, we purposefully wanted it to be a surprise.
but now I've ruined the surprise. So you have not, sir. You've just uh, driven people to their favorite bookseller to buy the book. It kind of reminded <laughs> me of the childhood classic that I own probably nine copies of because we lose them every year and we buy them, of the Christmas book where you get to smell the peppermint and you get to smell the Christmas yeah. tree and smell the gingerbread. And it's actually a labor of love. I hope everyone today goes out and, like me, buys a few dozen copies of Together is Better because it's so great. Simon, our time is ending. Uh, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in life? Huh. Huh. Uh, I, I mean, there's a few that pop into mind. I don't know. If I don't think it's Please, fair to say to the us. biggest one. Um, there's a few. There's a few that that I think are seminal that have guided me and continue to guide me. One is um, I don't have to know all the answers, and I definitely don't have to pretend that I do. Um, uh, the most important lesson, I guess, look at that, I am wrong. There is a most important lesson. The most important lesson I learned in my life, the seminal lesson, is to ask for help. Um, it, it is the most difficult and most powerful thing um, anyone can ever do. Um, and turns out we're surrounded by people who want to be there and want to support us. And how dare we be so selfish to deny them the honor of being there to help guide us and support us. Simon, as I mentioned when we opened your TED Talk, How Great Leaders Inspire Action, I believe is one of the top three or four most watched TED Talks in history. It is the most watched, I believe, TED Talk on the topic of leadership. I encourage everyone to, um, after they purchase their copy of Together is Better, then pop over and watch your TED Talk. What's next for you, sir? Um, there's a few things I'm working on. You know, I, I, I want to start writing again. I, I miss writing. Um, I founded an organization called The Curve. Um, you can learn more about it at thecurve.org. Um, it's, it's devoted to modernizing and bringing policing into the 21st century. Um, the profession of policing, when, it, when you look at leadership theory, is 20 or 30 years behind. And so um, I know that for lasting positive change to happen, it has to happen from the inside out. And so I'm working with some of the most forward-thinking police chiefs and sheriffs from across the country, Republican to Democrat, as we figure out ways to, to, to modernize um, the way policing is conducted in this country. So I'm doing that. Um, and you know, I'm just sort of fascinating with, fascinated with the changing world order and the way that our, 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 our world is changing and, and, and how we have to adapt for, the, for a changing world. You know, you know little things. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you a Star Wars fan? What's going on there behind you? I am a big Star Wars nerd, yes. That is a Mandalorian helmet. So the Mandalorian helmet, I'm saying it with a straight face. I mean, after all, it was Booty Call, my top favorite movie, so right. I have no credibility. It's positioned, interestingly, on this mural of a flower. Did yeah. you curate this intentionally? What's going on behind you? Um, I mean, I like the painter. Her name is Karen Gerard. Um, and I used to, when COVID started, I was in my, my dining room, like we all were, with a camera. And I happened to have a painting by Karin Gerard behind me in my dining room. And that was my backdrop for, you know, a lot of COVID. And when I finally sort of made a sort of more professional setup, I didn't want to lose the painting. So I, I called Karin and said, can I make a piece of wallpaper <laughs> out of one of your paintings and stick it behind me? And she was very generous to say yes. So that's a big sticker of Karin's, uh, one of her paintings. And you know, it's, it's my office, so it's got my nerdy things in it. It's got my challenge coins and some Lego, because I'm a Lego nerd, I love Lego. And of course, uh, Star Wars, because this is where I hang out, and so I want to look at the things that I like. I love Lego, especially at three in the morning when I'm walking downstairs to let the dog out to do his business and my children <laughs> have not picked. Yes, yes, thank you, Lego. Thank you for the acupuncture. Um, my plantar fasciitis has been cured by Lego in the morning time. There you Simon go, Sinek. See? Simon Sinek, thanks for your generosity. We wish you the best of success. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Really appreciate it. Our honor, sir. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.